Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. This is the uh, CCS External Group Seminar. Welcome. And today we have the uh, privilege of welcoming Professor Mingyan Liu as a visiting researcher to the CCS Group. Uh, and she'll be with us from this week through the end of June. Uh, today, let's see, actually before that I'll say uh, she's an associate professor at the University of Michigan in the uh, Department of um, electrical engineering and computer science, uh, got her PhD from uh, Maryland in 2000, uh, and has research interests in uh, performance modeling and analysis uh, and ad hoc networks. Uh, and she'll be telling us about uh, some of her work in cognitive uh, radio today. Thank you very much for the introduction, Phil. Um, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be, to, to, to come here and um, visiting your lab for the next three and a half months, and um, um, hopefully uh, we'll get to work on some exciting things. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about um, centers on the concept of opportunistic spectrum access, and mostly this is joint work with my uh, former student, Nicholas Chen, who is now with uh, MIT Lincoln Lab. He graduated last year. Um, so most of these motivations should be fairly, I think, um, clear to, to most of, if not all of you. Um, the, the basic motivation behind <coughs> opportunistic spectrum access has two aspects. One is there's increasing number of wireless uh, devices, okay? And that introduced basically um, result in an overcrowded spectrum. On the other hand, if you look at specific spectrum bands, you see abundant opportunities, basically white spaces that exist here and there. According to, so this is data, old data from 2003, over 62% white space exists in spectrum under 3G. So on the one hand, you have all these emerging devices all want to share the same spectrum. On the other hand, you have license bands that are really underutilized. So this gives rise to, oh, I really should be standing here. I'm missing the, does this not work? Uh, just do this, yeah, let me just do this. Does it not work? Uh, try this. Move? Yes, that did. Maybe you click on the screen. Let me see if this moves now. Yeah, okay. okay. So this leads to, gives rise to the idea of um, dynamically rather than statically allocate the spectrum. Now the basic concept is really an old one, right? This is similar to the, the difference between CSMA versus TDMA or FDMA. One is dynamic allocation, the other is static allocation. The new thing here is to open up license spectrum. So these are li the spectrum already licensed to primary users, and now we want to open these up to secondary users with certain priority given to the primary users. So that's the new thing. And roughly speaking, we can call opportunistic spectrum access as allowed to allow secondary users to exploit the instantaneous availability of spectrum license to primary users. So those two, mo two aspects of the motivation gives rise to the desire to dynamically allocate spectrum. The fundamental question here is, how do we allow these users, primary and secondary included, to coexist in such a way that enhances spectrum efficiency? Right? That's the ultimate goal, is to enhance spectrum efficiency. And these may include to introduce minimum disruption to the primary user. Okay? Um, to allow efficient channel access and transmission scheduling by secondary user and to allow efficient sharing among secondary users. Um, just to briefly illustrate the opportunities and challenges that arise from this scenario is most, um, 
for a secondary user that comes into this multi-channel system and then all these licensed spectrums that are all of a sudden open uh, up for him to use, there are different types of diversities to exploit. There's the temporal diversity, spectral diversity, and multi-user diversity. Right? So the channel quality as perceived by this user varies over time and it varies from one channel to another. Okay? And it, these are perceived differently by different users. So these diversities can all now be exploited by this user. It's arguable how much gain these diver diversities may bring. It may depend on the, the scale of the network, the mobility pattern of the network, and other factors. But conceptually, um, these are opportunities that the user can exploit. Okay? Some of the challenges that also arise, one is effective resource sharing has always been a difficult problem. Yes. I guess I'm really surprised that you, you, you're saying temporal spectral and multi-user in the same vein. It seems like multi-user diversity is it, it's a different kind of a thing. Like, I, I understand why temporal and spectral diversities are opportunities, uh, but multi-user diversity doesn't appear so much of like an opportunity, but it's just like, seems like a better way of doing anything. Uh, um, yes, the reason I'm... I'm Correct. The reason I'm, I'm throwing it in here is just you have a multi-channel and multi-user system. So if you have a single user, a multi-channel, then clearly he's looking at temporal and spectral diversity as he ex basically goes through all these different channels and over time trying to basically take the best opportunity. Now you have multiple users. So then at any given time, for any given spectrum band, it may, the perception uh, for, uh, by the two u different users may be different. So again, from a resource allocation point of view, if you can, you, you, you can do it, it's good if considering, let's just say for the time being, let's, um, let's forget about fairness and that other issues. Total, uh, purely from a throughput um, perspective, at any given time for any given channel, you want to give it to the user who has better perceived signal to noise ratio, for instance. Right. So that's basically one more um, dimensional degree of freedom, if you like. Um, that is different from temporal and spectral, that if I have a single user, I have those. But now I have multiple users, then there's one more, actually, diversity, if you like, to exploit. Yes? So um, if I get this right. Uh, you, you said, give it to the user. Can you elaborate who's giving this to Yes. Them? So that's the, that's the difficulty, right? The, that sentence was really phrased as if I have a centralized system, that I have some manager who, who basically deals out these um, spectrum blocks, if you like. Uh, in reality, you may have a distributed system. And therefore, if you want to realize that, you may need a carefully designed protocol so that somehow the users have incentive, more incentive to use um, a particular spectrum at a given time if his signal to noise ratio, let's say, exceed certain threshold and has this incentive to use it if his quality is really poor. Yeah, that, that opens up uh, a lot of questions on the views, right? On the views? The views of the system, right? Yes. I mean, if, if you're just relying on my saying that I've got better signal strength than you have, then that system I agree. Um, so that has to be a very carefully designed system, right? Um, but the, the, the multi-user diversity uh, arises from, from that, basically, if they're all telling the truth and abide, abide by that, OK? Um, so some of the challenges I'm listing here, resource allocation can be a difficult thing to do. Secondly, the system can be highly, heterogene uh, highly heterogeneous. You have different devices with different capabilities, and different channels may have different characteristics. On top of that, there are different policy and regulatory rules that apply. So for instance, some channels may, may, uh, may, be, may allow certain interference at a low level to the primary user, and some other channels will have to be sensed to be idle before a secondary user can come in and use that channel and so on and so forth. So these all introduce difficulty to the modeling aspect of the problem. Um, 
with this scenario, there are different perspectives that re researchers have taken. Um, this is not, is not an exhaustive list, uh, but th these are some of the main directions um, that you have, uh, we have seen um, research going. One, the first one is spectrum sharing. So this is taking the viewpoint that I have a number of secondary users. They all want to share the spectrum. How do we coordinate their behavior so they can do this efficiently? Okay? So there are game theoretical approaches, there are rule-based algorithms, and folks from, from MSR here also have uh, worked on this. Um, one example is the, the uh, last year's MobiHawk paper on spectrum, time spectrum block allocation. So these are all basically trying to regulate multiple users' behavior. A second direction is spectrum access. So this takes um, more the viewpoint of a single secondary user. So this single user comes into this multi-channel system and is trying to basically do the best for himself. Okay? Um, in terms of uh, allocating its time and its energy to get the best, let's say, throughput or get the, uh, the most amount of data transmitted for a given energy level and so forth. So this is a second direction. A lot of the concept here applies really more broadly to generic multi-channel systems, not just um, licensed channels in the presence of a primary user. For instance, if you look at, oops, if you look at uh, this, this first part, uh, the, all work done here can pretty much be applied to a multi-channel uh, multi system shared by multiple users. The only thing is you may have different channel characteristics if you have the presence of a primary user. Okay? And obviously, this also opens up uh, new opportunities in cross-layer design. For instance, um, people have looked at the joint design of advanced signal processing algorithms at the physical layer and the, uh, and the spectrum access at the MAC and network layer. Um, because a lot of the uh, sensing and probing op, uh, quality and capability of the device is determined by how you tune the spectrum sensor. And you, we may have the freedom of trading off false alarm with missed probabilities at the, uh, at the sensing level. That said, uh, any questions? That said, uh, the view I'm going to take for the remainder of my talk is going to be focusing on a single user and its own resource constraints. Specifically, I'm going to briefly describe what I mean by probing mechanism at the MAC layer and the basic resource allocation problem that arise from there. And I'm going to take a look at two specific problem scenarios. One we um, deal with with stochastic optimization approaches and the other we're going to apply competitive analysis approach. And I'll conclude the talk after that. Okay, so in order to take advantage of multiple channels and the temporal and spectral diversity, the first and foremost thing we, we need to be able to do is to find out the quality of a given channel. Okay? At the course level, I need to find out whether a primary user is actually using this. Okay? Um, at the finer level, I might be able to find out the received, perceived uh, the receiver SNR, for instance, okay? Or the power level I need to use so as to introduce a limited amount of interference to a primary user, okay? So here is an example. There are other ways to sense the channel. This is an example of active sensing. And this is given within the framework of 802.11, and this is a particularly simple. We all know the basic RTS-CTS mechanism used in 802.11. The sender sends out a reservation packet RTS and responded by, from the desired receiver, a CTS packet, basically reserving the floor around each node, respectively. And then they can continue, they can now start the data transmission from this point on. The idea here then is the intended receiver can simply piggyback channel information, this blue node can piggyback channel information onto the CTS packet. And when the receiver received the CTS packet, he will have known the channel quality perceived by the receiver. Okay? 
if we're only interested in whether the channel is busy or, ocu or occupied, um, we could also, one could also perform uh, passive sensing, okay? That is completely done, solely done by the sender. If we do this, then one can imagine the following sequential probing mechanism. Let's say we have multiple channels in the system. Each channel is color coded <laughs> by a different color. Uh, the blue color here denotes what we call a home channel. So all nodes start in a home channel. And the sender now sends out a RTS packet in the home channel to the desired receiver. The rece if the receiver successfully receives it, he replies with the CTS and piggyback onto the packet the channel information and this yellow color denotes which channel he would like the, the pair to switch onto next time. Okay? So this now results in both receiver, both the sender and receiver switching to the yellow channel and do the same thing in the yellow channel. Okay? And the same same thing repeats um, until at some point the receiver decides that this now it's a good time to stop and let's transmit data in, let's say, a pink channel. Okay? And upon completion of data transmission, they all basically return to the home channel, indicated by the blue color. A couple of things. One is, this is simply an example of what one might consider doing. And this is based on this MOAR um, algorithm proposed by, the, uh, by Edward Knightley's group at Rice University. Um, the key thing I would like to observe here is one is this gives rise to a sequential process between the sender and the receiver at each instant of time um, given by these time slots. Uh, they basically collectively or individually by the receiver, they need to decide what, wh which channel is the next one to probe. And based on the history of the probed information, he decides which channel to probe next or whether it's time to stop, and when he stops, which channel to use for transmission. Okay? In general, the channel we use for transmission may or may not have to be the channel we last probed. Okay? Uh, this, here, this is the difference between allowing recall or not allowing recall, depending on the assumptions on the coherence time and the, the characteristic of these channels. We may allow data transmission to occur at a channel that's probed earlier. Any questions regarding this scenario? Now, the main information, as I've already mentioned, most of these gathered through this uh, process is whether a channel is busy or idle. And on top of that, we may be able to gather information on the receiver SNR. This is in addition to what we may, may already know ahead of time. That includes channel bandwidth. That includes other channel statistics we may assume to know. Uh, for instance, the occupancy probability distribution that perhaps given by a Markovian model that is constructed using historical data and so forth. Okay? So this is a one scenario. A second scenario, an alternative within the same framework, we can imagine that the decision as to which channels to probe and in what sequence is made ahead of time, okay? let's say by the sender. And therefore, when he sends out the RTS packet, it simply illustrates the, the sequence of channels to probe. And from that point on, the pair essentially just perform sensing according to this predetermined sequence. And at the end of that sequence, they pick the best channel they have seen and transmit data in that channel. Okay? Yes? So uh, is this done at the packet level? Each packet, each packet. That is, for my purpose, is, is somewhat unspecified. Meaning that um, as long as, from my point of view, th this has to be done, of course, at a time scale that is uh, consistent with the channel statistics. Meaning that uh, essentially I'm going to assume that between this time point, when they start the sensing, and when they, when they finish the data, uh, data transmission, the channel statistics stay the same. Yeah, but uh, if, the, if you spend so much time probing, they in, in, and they only, only send a short package. That's right. So I'm going to, to present two 
ways of defining the objective function. In one of the, the uh, objective function, I am going to fix the total amount of time that I have available. So this, sequ this, um, this probing uh, process cannot go on forever. And in the other case, this is limited by a probing cost. So typically, you're thinking about probing saying to be less than four times, less than four actual seconds. Probably. It, it also depends on how many channels I have and how long it takes to probe a channel and, again, the channel statistics. So realistically speaking, I may be very limited as to how many channels I can actually probe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? A question. Uh, do you assume the sender and the receiver always listen all the time for the blue channel? Um, in this framework, yes, it is assumed. That is, when I'm not busy, uh, engaged in other communication, I always return to the uh, home channel. But if I'm busy, for example, that's correct. data, I may not be listening that's on right. home channel. You may not be listening on home channel, and if I want to talk to you, I won't be able to get a reply from you. Okay. So that means uh, when you are sending the RTS and uh, CTS information in the blue channel, mm -hmm. there may be other uh, um, uh, receivers not aware of that information, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I noticed the difference with the uh, work the uh, UN and the US have done. And uh, in that case, you assume you have a separate transceiver, which always is a right? I, I think in that case, you can simplify this uh, uh, allocation weighting. And if I you have a dedicated channel, that. Dedicated mm -hmm. receiver on the mass channel. Dedicated receiver. Uh, uh, sorry, can you elaborate that? Dedicated receiver. Uh, basically, two devices. Mm -hmm. One is just a receiver listening on the blue channel mm -hmm. all the time. All the time, okay. The other is uh, basically a device which you can change to uh, basically okay. change mm -hmm. all the color channels mm -hmm. to send and receive. Okay. I think that will simplify the model. I mean, in your case, mm -hmm. even if, uh, I mean, I'm not sure you can catch all the information. I mean, the reason is you don't know. I mean, what are the uh, other nodes missing in your channel? So it, they can actually miss all those informations. Uh, what, you, you mean the, the, the request to send, send out on a home channel? Yeah. Um, yes, you could miss, but that is an indication that the node is busy doing something else. It seems that you, you're, you're proposing multi-core architecture. It's a different architecture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to um, first pause this section to my conference company and say, yeah, set it. So you can tell me the right document. Right. Um, is this, are you specifically talking about dot 11, or are you talking about something else? I mean, any other frequencies? Right. Are you talking about the generic mechanism? I'm talking about something generic. And this, so, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's the only thing I want. So, if, if that's, that's the case, you're actually making a lot of assumptions about your control channel or your home channel, correct? Like, for example, if I take a home channel, if you take a very specific case and you say, I mean, just for, for argument's sake, a 2.4K is my home channel, mm -hmm. right? And you want, to, you, you want to talk at the 700 megahertz. Mm -hmm. What do you see in 2.4 in terms of your ranges versus what you see in 700 completely different? So, no matter what you negotiate, in 2.4, it's not going to match up what you see below, right? So but that I'm not negotiating in the home channel. Home channel is really a synchronization mechanism to, to make sure I get hold of you as the receiver, and then we can start exploring the quality at the, at the, at the 700 megahertz. So, I mean, there's a possibility no, that... Let me, uh, oh, did I miss So you and I can talk to each other at 2.4. Okay. okay. Right? Uh, or actually, I, I should flip this around to make it make my point. I guess. Let's say you and I can talk at 700 megahertz. Okay. Right. But we can't talk in 2.4. So let's say your control channel was at 700 megahertz. Okay. Just because we talk on, on, on 700 megahertz doesn't necessarily mean I can talk on any other channels. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So this this sequence is going to break, right? So basically, I I guess an extreme case would be they dis they start at 700 megahertz and they, they decide to switch to 0.4. And 
let's just say this guy actually never received the, the, the RTS in 2.4, in which case th this, this mechanism is going to break. They're going to time out. They're going to basically uh, reset. I mean, I, I, think, I think your control channel is a, is a static control channel on a particular frequency band limits, limits your okay. conversation. So let me, let me address that. I don't mean to say this control channel is static. Okay? So I haven't gone into all the details of this protocol, and this is not my protocol to begin with. Oh. Uh, yeah. Sorry. This is something I borrowed, um, but I don't mean to say this is not my responsibility. I'm just saying this is um, my way of introducing a, a basically a scenario that can be des described by a decision process. Okay. Since it's not your, then I will say this is actually bad for <laughs> I would. <laughs> I was going to say, I, you you jumped ahead of me. I was going to say the same thing. That is, I think this particular pro protocol doesn't actually exploit what we want to provide with multi-channel, multi-user diversity. Nonetheless, it's, um, it's a simple enough way for me to, to basically introduce this decision process. That is, okay, you can vary. You can say, I have a dynamically uh, designed home channel, but as soon as you get hold of the receiver, there's some synchronization between the transmitter and the receiver, and collectively, they need to figure out which channel to use for data transmission. That's the, that's the key point, okay? Um, all right, so, so now the objective is for the pair to basically maximize some throughput measure, taking into account the cost of probing and subject to some constraints on energy, amounts of interference introduced, and so forth. So let me now show you a specific formulation. Um, here, let's just say I have a total of n channels, denoted by the set omega. And remember, I'm only considering a single channel here. He has available to him n channels. Using channel j is going to generate what I call a reward xj. And you can view this xj as either the probability of successful transmission or the effective data rate that is going to the user is going to get out of this transmission. XJ is a random variable, and I'm also going to assume that this random variable is in general continuous. Okay, you're considering some of the devices that provides a continuum of data rates, and in particular, if this is a probability of success, then it's a continuous random variable. Uh, the distribution of XJ is known a priori. That's a pretty strong assumption, um, but that's typically assumed um, if I am going to take a stochastic optimization framework. I'm going to assume that these rewards are mutually independent between channels and between time slots. Now here what I mean by time slot is essentially the time frame within which I conduct processing and data communication. Okay? So one round has nothing to do with the next round, and therefore I just I can just solely focus on a single round that consists of a probing sequence and data communication. Okay? Now, the user can probe any channel. If he probes the channel J, it's going to give him the exact realization of XJ. Okay? So he finds out exactly what the probability is or exactly the data rate. But it's going to incur a positive cost C of J. And you can view this as, say, delay and so forth, or energy. And I'm going to normalize these two quantities to be between 0 and 1. And that is without generality. Now, the decision process, this is basically an abstraction of the scenario I just showed earlier, is essentially to sequentially select which channel to probe next and when to stop. Initially, the total set, the set of unprobed channels is given by the set omega. And I denote that by S. And the best probed value at this point is zero because I haven't seen anything yet. Okay. Then at each step, the user decides between the following three actions. I can, the first action is to continue to probe some channel J. And that will result in the, up, in the following updates. I subtract J from the set of unprobed channels. And I update the best seen probe value to be the maximum between the old value and the realization of XJ. Right. Straightforward. The second option is to transmit, to decide that I have seen enough, I'm going to transmit using the best channel I have seen so far. And in that case, I'm going to basically receive a reward of U. 
I know that for sure. And the last option is to basically transmit using some channel that I haven't seen before. Now, this may or may not be allowed for all channels. Okay? This is what we'll call guessing. You basically say, I've seen enough of them. They're none of them is good enough. I don't want to probe anymore. I'm just going to take my chances with one of the channels I haven't seen. Now, if you do that, obviously, you run the risk of, one, the rate can be extremely low. Two, you may introduce um, on, uh, on, on basically uh, uh, on satisfactory uh, interference level to the primary user. For the time being, let me assume that all channels can be guessed. And later on, I'll talk about what happens if a subset of them cannot be guessed. Okay? Now, if I do probe, do transmit using an unprobed channel, my reward is simply going to be the expectation of this XJ. Yes? Just to clarify, uh, one, uh, when you probe a channel, uh, when, you, when you get the channel capacity, do you have any noise? So it appears that you say... In, in the probing the itself? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in general, yes, definitely. It doesn't seem to be modeling. So here I'm not explicitly modeling it, simply because if I, again, if I don't know the statistics of the noise, that's a different issue. But if I know the statistics of the noise, then I can bundle that with the rate xj. Because all I care about is really just the expectation of xj. That, so what that means is when I do probe, when I probe a channel, what I get instead of the realization of xj is yet another expectation of xj because of the noise. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and my second question mm -hmm. is, when you have probed a number of channels, I mean, if this thing gets really busy, it could be possible that the previous probed channels can easily be changed. Correct. So later on, I'm going to differentiate between what I call fast-fading channels and slow-fading channels. So for the fast channels, I cannot maintain the value that I probed. I either probe and use it, or I lose it. But I can, I can reprobe those channels. For the time being, for the most part of the analysis, let me limit my attention to the case where these, ch these values that I probed stay till I finish communication. And I'll see how those um, basically carries to the, 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 the other one. Yeah. I have a question about this problem um, on definition. It seems to me that this is very, very similar to what people call the multi-arm bandit problem. I don't know whether you've heard the term. I, I'm familiar with, the, with, the, with, with that class of problems. So, seems to be the same, uh, at least at first glance, so, so could okay, you elaborate yes. on Yes, I'll tell you the difference. Um, in this context, a so multi-armed band bandit problem refers to the following problem. I have n controlled Markov chains. Okay? At any time instance, I can choose to play, let's just say, or control one of the Markov chain, and receive a reward and pay a cost. That chain now evolves according to the control given by the control. The other chain, their states remain frozen. Okay? Now, if they're also, they are also evolving, then that's called restless bandit. But let's talk about multi-arm uh, multi bandit problem. The main difference here is these n channels, once I probe, I have nothing to do with this channel anymore. Because I have seen its value, and it's registered. I'm never going to go back and get more future reward. My, the set of action space is, is decreasing. It's denoted by this S. So every time I'm looking at, at a smaller and smaller set. It's kind of a special case of, of the other problem. Uh, the other problem, if you have a, a let, let's say, a Markov chain that just has one state, and once you probe it, you, you know, without the variance, then like if the, if the variance is, is, is zero, right, then so, so it's the same. What's coming up, the second okay. bigger problem, is that the reward is not taken as I take the action. When I probe a channel, I don't actually receive the reward. The reward is given by the, the end maximum. Okay. If I probe a channel that I'm never going to use, that reward never gets realized. That's the bigger difference here. Does it make sense? OK, yeah, I, I yeah. see the point. That, uh, maybe we can take this Yeah, uh, But, because, but the bottom so line is I don't think this is a special case of, of that. And a second, um, and if that may help uh, illustrate, one assumption here is these random variables are continuous. 
And in a multi-arm bandit problem, these Markov chains are all assumed. If not finite, they're countable. And that's a big difference. Okay. Yeah, so. I disagree for now, but. OK. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, I'll be more than happy to, to talk sure. about this offline. OK, so any other questions? So this is the, uh, the decision process. And with that, let me introduce two objectives. One is what I call constant data time. So suppose I have a fixed amount of data I want to transmit. What I want to do is to maximize the total reward, expected reward, less the cost. That's given by this term over here. So x pi of tau. Tau is a random stopping time that illustrates the stopping time of the, the, the probing process. And pi of tau is basically the channel that I decide to use when I stop. And x pi of tau is essentially the reward that I get when I transmit using that channel, minus the cost that I have accumulated through the probing process. Now it turns out that this objective is equivalent to maximizing the throughput for a given amount of data. Okay? So this is my first objective. Second objective is what I call constant access time. So here what I want to do is to maximize the total reward if I am given a limited amount of time to finish probing plus uh, transmission. So the difference is illustrated in these two pictures. Here, I can continue to probe to whenever. And by the time I stop, I take the, the best. Uh, so basically, when I transmit, I get that reward. And this is a fixed amount of data I have to transmit. And I, I finish the process here. In the second case, in the constant access time case, the total amount of time I have is capped at capital T. And therefore, the more probing I conduct, the less time I have for data transmission. So here, the, the, the best interpretation of x is data rate. And this is time, as in seconds, for instance. And delta is assumed to be the amount of time it takes for me to probe an individual channel. And this is how many times I probe them. Okay? So these two, one maximizes the throughput for a given amount of data. The other maximizes the total amount of data for a given amount of time. So most of my analysis will be um, within the context of this first objective, but I'll show uh, how the results there applies to the second objective. Okay. So here is just some extra notations uh, for the convenience of presentation. The strategy given by pi, and here the state of the system is given by the pair u and s. u, again, is the best value seen so far, and s is the remaining set of channels that haven't been probed. And the strategy takes on three actions, either probe channel j, guess j, if I just transmit in channel j, or retire u, which denotes that the strategy simply decides to stop and transmit using the best channel he has seen. Okay. Now, with that, we have the following dynamic programming representation of the problem. It's really pretty straightforward. The value function, which is the maximum expected remaining reward given the states u and s, is the maximum between three terms. Either I retire or I continue to probe, in which case I pay a cost, but I update my states to be the maximum between the old value and the new value, and I subtract uh, the channel from the state as uh, the set s, or I transmit using the unprobe channel. In that case, of course, I'm just going to pick the one that gives me the best uh, expectation. The problem with trying to directly compute this, uh, this uh, dynamic program is one, we have assumed that u is a continuous quantity between 0 and 1. So precisely computing this is not possible. Usually, you have to discretize the state space and use approximation methods. The other uh, problem is the state s. In order to compute this, you have to basically to compute v of u and s. You have to consider all the, the basically the power set of s in order to do that. So the approach we have taken here is instead of trying to directly compute this. We're trying to basically derive properties of optimal strategies and see if we can use those properties to construct algorithms. Uh, work most related to the one presented here 
uh, are given by the following two sets of authors. Um, the first one basically looked at st statistically identical rewards and statistically I basically identical probing cost, and they don't allow guessing and they allow, allow no recall. Um, when you don't allow recall, meaning that a channel that you probe and don't use, you lose the opportunity of using it. So this reduces the problem to the classic uh, secretary or marriage problem. So basically you have a sequence of candidates that you're interviewing or sequence of bride, brides that you're interviewing and you're trying to pick the one, but the one that you decide not to marry or hire, um, they, they leave, for, they're gone forever. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, a, it's called the secretary problem. So you cannot call them back. Then this, this reduces to a classic stopping time problem, and then we know how to solve that. Okay? So it turns out the main challenge here is, is one is we allow recall, and one is we allow guessing. Okay? Again, recall is to be able to use a channel you have seen earlier. Okay? And guessing is to, to basically take your chance with a channel you are not going to probe. Um, and then the second set, the main difference here is they considered uh, channels modeled by discrete random variables. And again, the approach they take is different. They basically went straight to suboptimal strategies and approximation algorithms. In the end, uh, in the end some of my algorithms are still going to be suboptimal, but it's derived uh, from a different avenue. Okay, so the main property here is it turns out the decision process, the optimal strategy, has a threshold property. Okay? But that, but what do I mean by that? That is, for a given information state, U and S, if this is the best value I've seen so far, and S is the remaining set, then the best decision is given by two thresholds, a lower threshold, B of S, higher threshold, A of S. Both of these are, quantity, are functions of the set S. Imagine these two quantities between 0 and 1. If the best seen value is above this higher threshold, then I'm going to retire. I'm going to say, good enough, I'm going to stop and transmute using the best channel I've seen. If the best seen value is between these two thresholds, then basically I will continue to probe. If it's below the lower threshold, I'm going to say, I give up. These are all pretty bad. I'm going to take my chance with the best unprobed, value, uh, unprobed channel and guess. So that's basically what's given by this threshold property. What remains to be determined is these thresholds, and what if I'm in the middle of these two thresholds and they continue to probe, which is the next channel that I will probe, given by this J of U. Okay? And the definition of these is really just derived from this property. This is the smallest value for, which for, for me to retire, and the other is the highest value for me to guess. Okay? Yes? I'm not sure. Uh, so, in the guest scenario, can you, the data pack can also be used as a full package for your for the receiver doesn't receive it, or there's no acknowledged package sending back to the sender, then you can consider you, it as a. Probe. You obtain certain information from uh, with the channel, right? Yeah, so yes, uh, that's correct, and that will play a role if you are trying to optimize across rounds for multiple rounds. So what you gather now may be used for your next transmission. Here, it's simpler. I'm only considering a single round. So even though you get information from that channel, it's not going to be useful because your data communication has ended. Does it make sense? But if you still have time, you may can uh, Yes, if you still have time, you, you, you can do it otherwise, but then th this, has, this makes no difference between, oh, I see. You're saying, I'm going to take my chance with data communication. If it doesn't go through, then essentially it's like a probing packet. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting suggestion. Uh, it's not modeled here. Here, it's a more straight straightforward cut. Um, by the time I decide to stop, I either guess or I, trans I, I retire. And that, that's the end of the story. And if I guess, this is the reward I'm going to get, the expectation. Yeah. Um, the problem of directly using this property is these indices, I'm going to call these thresholds also indices, these are not really easy to compute because these are functions of a set S. Okay? So 
let me further simplify the problem, the, the approach, by saying, well, instead of looking at these AS and BS, I'm going to look at AG and BJ. What are these? These are thresholds for a singleton set, when the set, set S contains only a single channel J. Now, these are easy to, to compute, because, uh, because I only have one channel in the, uh, in the set. I'm going to show you why that is the case. And the goal is to see whether I can determine the optimal strategy using these individual channel thresholds, or individual channel indices. So um, intuitively, this is what these indices mean. Suppose I only have one channel remaining on scene. Um, this is my assumption that let's just say x is uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. This is my probing cost. Then what happens is, if you look at the horizontal axis between 0 and 1, this is the best scene value so far, u. This is the expected reward given by different actions. Since I only have one channel left unprobed, once I make the decision now, my decision process is over. Okay? If I decide to, re to guess, then my reward is, regardless, is independent of the best seen value so far. Because I'm just going to get whatever this guess channel is going to give me. So that's simply the expectation of that channel. If I decide to retire, then I'm going to receive u. So that's given by this linear function here. Okay? That's basically y equals x. If I decide to probe the remaining channel, then the reward is given by this blue curve. Okay? taken into account the, the probing cost. Now, these indices or thresholds, AJ and BJ, are nothing but the intersection between the, the dotted and the blue curve and the blue and the red dashed line. Okay? What it says is, above this intersecting point, my best option, my best decision is to retire. Below this intersecting point, my best decision should be to guess. Okay? In the middle, I should continue to probe because probing is, going, is giving me the best reward. Okay? So this is essentially the meaning between, of these two thresholds. Now, if I only have one channel in a set, then it's pretty easy for me to compute these two quantities, just the intersection between two functions. And we know these two functions. Okay? Um, any questions here? Now, the, the cost here essentially determines the width of this region in the middle. The lower the cost, the bigger this region. Now, intuitively, that makes sense because if the cost is high, then, then I have disincentive, right? I don't have much incentive to continue to probe. It's also possible for these two thresholds to coincide. They, will, they can all meet at this point, in which case I simply don't probe at all. I either just retire or I guess. Okay? Okay, again, so once. On, with this understanding, my goal now is to see how far I can go with these individual indices without having to go to AS and BS, which are difficult to compute. Um, so before I move forward, let me just introduce a particular ordering of these channels. Now we have these uh, channel indices. It makes sense to sort them in, loosely speaking, decreasing order of their quality. Okay? So I'm going to sort them in descending order of their A indices. Okay? And I'll relabel them 1 through n. Okay? So essentially, the, first, uh, the channel 1 is going to have the highest A index. Okay? And if I have a tie, I'm going to break them in this way. And you can ignore the details. Essentially, this is breaking the tie according to their one-step reward if I probe that channel. Okay? So this is yet another way of differentiating these channels. So I'm going to relabel these channels 1 through n. Now, it turns out. With that labeling, the, optimal, the structure of the optimal strategy is given by these three cases. Meaning what? Meaning that given that I'm in states u and s, my optimal strategy can only take on one of these three forms. In the first case, if the best seen value u is above the highest A index, I retire. Otherwise, I probe. And if, and there's another threshold here, when u falls below this threshold, I'm going to guess the first channel. Okay? So in this case, I actually never take action um, other than on any channel other than the first channel, the best channel. The second case is I will retire if the best seen value is high enough 
followed by probing the first channel, followed by probing a second channel if the best seen value is sufficiently low. That's the second possibility. And the third possibility is I'm going to either retire if the value seen so far is high enough, or I'm going to probe, but only the first channel. So basically, what this says is that it, great, it significantly narrows down the, the, the space in which I need to search for my optimal solution, okay? because it takes on only these three forms. Um, secondly, if you, if you look at all these three cases, it basically says if I ever were to guess a channel, the first channel is the only candidate. I would never guess any channel other than the first channel. This, of course, is all given the state UNS. Thirdly, there are only two channels I can possibly probe, the first channel and some other channel K. Okay? So this basically simplifies the, the process of searching for the uh, optimal strategy. Um, and one more observation here is the, the, the channel that I'm going to probe, other than the first one, does not, the identity of that channel doesn't vary with you. Okay? Any questions? Why, uh, why is K not two, say? Because your order is one, two, three. K is not two. Very good question. So the K, and I'll say picking two is a not bad thing to do. It performs pretty well. But K is not necessarily two because the relationship between these channels are, um, are rather complicated because um, the, the, the way I sort them is according to their highest value, uh, their, their high end, the high index A. Uh, there's also an index B that's hidden, right, unless I have a tie. So there is the probing cost and the reward that come into picture. So K is in general not two. Yeah. Because, see, I have two, uh, I have basically, I have two indices, A and B. And this sorting is, if there are no ties, right, is only, in, only determined by the A index. And the index is only a cutoff between retiring and probing. Okay, it, the identity of K really depends on what one turns out to be, what A1 is, what B1 is. So, strict, so basically, they, uh, it's not the same, but it turns out from our numerical um, experiments, picking one and two, the best two, because computationally, it's much simpler. And that's actually what we do in our algorithm. It performs pretty well. Yeah. Okay. So here are some special cases that we do know exactly. So one thing, this doesn't give me the complete picture. It gives me quite a bit about the optimal strategy, but it's not complete, right? Because still, I have to figure out what this cutoff is, and I have to figure out the identity of K if I want the optimal strategy. But there are some special cases for which I do know exactly what, these, um, what the optimal strategy is. Um, and that is the special case when all channels in S are identically distributed. Their probing costs may be different. In, in that case, channel quality-wise, they're all identical. So I essentially just sort them according to their costs. So the cheapest would be the best, right? And, and then if I look at the best channel, denoted by J star, and it so happens the probing region is 0 when AJ star equals BJ star, then the optimal strategy is either to retire or guess. Otherwise, I either, either retire or I probe. Okay? So this is one special case we know precisely what the optimal strategy is. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce three different algorithms using these properties that we have derived. The first one is what we call value function parameterization. Recall that earlier I introduced the value function that was indexed by the best seen value so far, u, and the set s. And I argued it's difficult to compute because u is a continuous quantity between 0 and 1, and you'd have to compute all subsets of s. Okay? Um, it turns out, using this property, we can now parameterize this value function by a constant ds, which is basically the, the, the cutoff, the, the threshold in those three cases. And, and there is a it's a relatively simple way of computing this constant. 
And if we do that, and then essentially I can compute this value function recursively, uh, and it, it will give me the optimal strategy in a finite number of steps, even the even if the uh, the channel um, the channel quantity uh, quality is given by continuous random variable. Okay, so this is one op algorithm that will give me precisely what the optimal strategy is. But again, the drawback here is I cannot get rid of this set S. I will have to consider the power set of S. So this is the first algorithm. Nonetheless, it is optimal. Now the next two algorithms are suboptimal. This is what I call a two-step look-ahead policy gamma. Now the intuition behind this algorithm is, is very simple. If you consider those three cases are presented, I observe that if I ever to act upon these channels, there are only two channels I ever use, okay, between probing and guessing. So why don't I just pick the two channels out of the set S, pretending that I have to stop within two steps. Okay? So now, strictly speaking, an optimal policy is an infinite step look ahead algorithm. Right? You have to consider all stopping times. Here, I'm just going to approximate it and say, I have to stop in two steps. Let me pick out the best two, policy, uh, two, two channels. And I look at the A's and, J and B's of these two channels and using the properties I have to decide what actions I should take. Okay, consider these two best channels. So that's basically how the algorithm works. And you can, going back to your question, you can simply pick channel one and channel two. I already sorted them. Or you can pick channel one and given the A1 and B1 and try to compute what that channel K is. Okay? So this is a two-step look ahead policy gamma. I'm going to show you the, uh, the performance in just a, slide, uh, in just a moment. Now, this policy obviously is optimal if my set S has only two channels remaining, right? Because then two-step look-ahead is optimal. It turns out to be also optimal if all channels in S are statistically identical. It coincides with the known optimal policy I just showed two slides ago. It is also optimal if I have a finite number of channel types, but I have infinite number of them in each type. So this basically says this policy, uh, it's uh, suboptimal, but there are special cases for, for which uh, it is optimal. Um, a third algorithm is based on a decomposition result. So I mentioned earlier that one of the key challenges of this problem is allow guessing. Okay? So what this result says is, suppose I consider the following subproblems. In each subproblem, I only one allow one channel to be guessed. Okay, so in the first problem, subproblem, I say all channels except for one can be uh, it, only channel one can be guessed. In the second subproblem, only channel two can be guessed. Okay, and suppose I can solve these individual problems separately. It turns out that I take these n problems. I pick the best policy, comparing the result of these n, n, uh, n subproblems, take the best one, and that one is essentially equivalent to solving the original problem. Okay? What this means is I can successfully decompose the original problem into n subproblems. So now the problem is how to solve one of the subproblems. And the subproblem, turns out, is given by this. If the, if Subproblem is labeled uh, above one. Okay? Channel one is my best channel. If the channels that can be allowed to be guessed is anything but the first channel, then I know exactly what the policy is. Okay? It's either retire or probe the first channel. So the only thing remaining unknown is what if the first channel can be guessed. Okay? So that's the remaining unknown part. And what we do is we can use the two step look ahead algorithm to figure that out. So this gives me the decomposed two-step look-ahead policy. I separate them into m problems. For m minus one of them, I know exactly what the policy is. And for the last one, I determine the best policy using the look-ahead algorithm. Okay. So before I show you the numerical result, let me just briefly go back to the second uh, objective function I had, which is constant access time policies. This problem is considerably, considerably more complicated um, computationally, not necessarily conceptually. Computationally, what happens is there is one more dimension to my information state, 
which is the total amount of time remaining in the state. Right? Because in this case, my total amount of time allowed is fixed. So as I go, I have to keep track of how much time I have left. This was not a consideration in the first case. Um, luckily, conceptually, they share a lot of similarities. For instance, even for this problem, there is a similar threshold property. The only thing difference is that now these thresholds are also functions of the remaining amount of time given by t bar. Okay, so now imagine essentially you have to solve the same problem for each amount, remaining amount of time. Okay, so computationally it's significantly more complicated, but conceptually they have these similar um, structure. Okay, so and therefore we can use the same algorithms, it's just I have to compute those, uh, to ex uh, execute those algorithms a lot more often. Okay, all right. Um, so Basically, I already mentioned this. I can modify this two-step look-ahead look algorithm for, the, for this problem as well, constant access time. All right, so here's some uh, comparison results. Um, we have compared the performance of algorithm with the optimal, and in order to be able to compute the algorithm, we essentially selected a discrete channel model. Okay? Um, the reward is either a fixed, uh, a fixed quantity ij um, with probably pj or otherwise it's not available. Okay? It's a two-state Markov chain um, given by, by this Markov chain. And for each, so the, the horizontal axis here is the number of channels we tried and this, this is the uh, number of trials, random trials for each n. The reward and the probabilities here are, are also randomly drawn, and this is their distribution. The cost is also randomly drawn, and the reason we did this, if you look at this complicated way of defining the, the probing cost, is actually to be able to ensure that all actions were taken in by the optimal strategy. Otherwise, there are cases you don't see any difference. Our algorithm will just be optimal. Um, so the blue curve here is the optimal algorithm. The black dot is algorithm beta, and that's the decomposed algorithm. Red is gamma. You see those two both perform um, very well. In particular, the black one is very close to the optimal. Okay? Well, basically, the, the reason behind this is, if you look at the two-step ahead algorithm, there are only a couple of steps in that algorithm that that deviates from the optimal algorithm you compare to the property. And unless those cases hit, the two-step algorithm is actually optimal. Okay? And the choices of the parameters here is just actually ensuring that those cases will hit at some point. Um, one more comparison here just to illustrate the benefit of guessing. Um, this green curve here is what happens if we don't allow guess. Okay? And this is basically the difference. And here's a similar curve uh, applying this, the uh, modified two-step look-ahead algorithm to the constant access time. Again, this is basically showing that the algorithm look, uh, works pretty well. And let me just discuss some of the policy constraints here. Um, I have assumed that all channels may be guessed, okay? and I have assumed all channels can be recalled. Okay? Now one question is what happens if these don't necessarily um, hold? So the first thing is what I uh, mentioned earlier. What if not all of them can be recalled? I have a, s a subset of fast fading channels. Okay? The probing result is only valid immediately after probing. And if I don't use them, I lose them. But I can go back and probe them if I think I might want to use them. Um, it turns out with this modification, we can come up with an equivalent formulation. It's basically changing. Uh, turning these subset of fast fading channels to slow fading channels that can be recalled but modifying their reward essentially. Okay? There's an equivalent formulation there that we can, uh, we can solve. Um, and the second possibility is what if a subset of channels cannot be guessed? Okay, so these are channels that the primary users have strict priority. You cannot interfere with them unless you, you know with a high degree of confidence they're not there, you cannot guess them. Um, in this case, the decomposition result applies. 
So remember these n decomposed problems. And essentially, I just now need to solve a subset of these decomposed problems. In each decomposed problem, only one channel can be guessed. right? So that algorithm applies, uh, applies well there. And the third possibly we consider is what if I do allow these channels to be guessed, but there's a guessing penalty. Okay. Um, it turns out in this case, again, the structural result of the problem remains. There is, again, there's an equivalent formulation. We have the same structural result. So it turns out, basically, the property we derived here is, um, is, is fairly general. Uh, that can be used in all these um, different cases. Any questions? So that basically uh, wraps up the, the first problem. And, the, and please don't worry. The second problem is considerably shorter. Um, so that basically is a joint um, probing and transmission scheduling problem. So now let me switch gear to the second one, where basically we use a different methodology. Um, the main weakness, if you like, of the previous uh, framework is that you assume you know the statistics of these channels. right? One always questions, how accurate is that information? And what if I don't know them at all? Um, now, the standard approach um, includes, again, this is not exhaustive, one is to use learning techniques okay, to adapt your algorithm to what you observe and to hopefully converge to a good policy. Okay? You can either estimate unknown parameters if you know the model. For instance, if I know my model is a two-state Markov chain, I just don't know the transition probability, you can use a learning algorithm to, to estimate that. And there are also cases when I don't actually know the model itself. Okay? I don't even know the channel may be described by two-state Markov chain. Uh, there are techniques to, to estimate that, and, come, and one can construct adaptive algorithms. Uh, another approach is to use a robust analysis, assuming the worst case scenario. Okay, so you design your protocol, uh, you, your, your algorithm assume the worst is going to happen, and you just want to ensure that your, your algorithm is going to perform fairly well in that worst case. And that's basically what I'm going to do here. Again, I have n channels. But now let me simplify uh, each channel and say each one of them is either available or not, okay, on or off. Now the user can probe, let's say, a subset of these channels and determine which ones are on and which ones are off. And then he can only use the ones that probe to be on, okay, to be probe to be available. The state vector is given by x, and 1 and 0 denotes them to be either available or not. And this is essentially statistics that are not known to the user, but they govern the, uh, the dynamics of the, of the channel. And this is what I will use to define what I mean by worst case. Now, again, if a user probes a channel to be available and use that channel, he's going to get a certain rate. Again, I'm going to call that uh, reward. And he, the reward vector is given by R. And I'm going to assume that these channels are sorted in decreasing order of their rates, if they're available. Okay? Now, the user can probe up to k channels. Again, this is just for generality. This is a number between 1 and n. He can probe all of them. And the probing reviews whether they're available or not. And he can use up to k0 of them for transmission. Again, this is for generality. This can be equal to k. The strategy now is basically to decide which ones to probe, okay, without knowing the likelihood of each one of them being available. Okay? The class of strategies is given here. Essentially, this ensures that because, as we will see, the strategies now are random. Okay? They're randomly drawn, and therefore, you cannot always guarantee um, Deter deterministically, so here is just to, to impose a constraint on the permissible strategy to ensure that the number of um, channels that you use is less than the number of channels that you probed. Okay? All right. So the performance measure is given by the expected reward of the strategy U, and this is a double expectation over the channel realization X and also over 
the realization of the strategy u. Again, this u may be random. And this looks ugly, but all it says is I'm going to get reward rj if it is available and if I decided to probe it, and that if it is within the limit of k0 that I'm allowed to use. Okay? The worst case analysis goes as follows. Um, I assume that there is a genie that uses k0 best available channels, okay? the highest rate. Because this is a genie that knows exactly the realization of these channels. So he knows in front of him which one's available, which one's not. So his reward is simply going to be the highest rates among those available. And my strategy is given by VXU. The star is the genie's uh, reward, and this is my reward. The competitive analysis is essentially trying to decide the best strategy so as to maximize the difference between me and the genie, or to minimize the ratio between me and the genie. Okay, so that this is max min or min max. This is basically trying to optimize the worst case performance. Okay? So what the genie is trying to do is basically trying to, to make sure that the difference is big. And what I'm trying to do is, is basically trying to, to um, minimize this difference. The, what, what the genie can control and what I can control is the genie controls the distribution of x. Okay? The genie decides the, the, uh, the, uh, the channel distribution so as to maximize this. What I control is the strategy u so as to minimize this, max, this maximum. Uh, similar here, the genie controls the distribution of the channel so as to minimize this ratio, and I control my strategy so as to maximize this minimum. And again, this is just more notation. Uh, formally speaking, uh, the strategies I'm seeking is to minimize this maximum or maximize this minimum, as I mentioned earlier. Okay? All right. Just one more slide on the basic approach that's used here is basically to come up. I'm here, I'm using this, uh, this competitive regret as an example. Uh, the method is, this is actually a fairly standard methodology, is to come up with a good lower bound to this min max, okay, by flipping the min and the max, okay. But the good thing here now is that the, max, the maximum is now on a given distribution, so this minimum can be calculated, okay. This approach is standard. The difficulty and a bit of art, there's a lot of trial and error, is how do you come up with the best lower bound you, you, you can? If you do that well enough, then maybe you can find a strategy that actually matches this lower bound. And if that happens, then you have found the best worst case strategy. Okay? Um, so that's basically uh, what I said here, is, is a lot of work goes into finding a good lower bound and then finding a strategy that matches the lower bound. Okay? And here, just to summarize the result we have, um, the, the, without going into the details, a lot of the notation that doesn't really um, provide more insight, um, is for the first case, competitive regret. This is the difference between me and the Gini. Uh, we know the class of optimal strategies, um, their, their properties, and we have a sequential procedure of constructing the optimal strategy. It's a randomized random strategy in general. And for the competitive ratio, uh, we know the optimal strategy. And on top of that, we also have closed form expression for the competitive ratio. Okay? In the first case, we actually don't have a closed form for the competitive regret. That's basically the, the optimal difference between me and the Gini. And this is the optimal ratio between me and the Gini. And here is just to illustrate. Um, some reasons behind uh, considering using this method. That the method itself is a conservative one. Why? Because I'm assuming the worst case. And in some cases, the worst case can be, can be very bad, that, that you, can pretty sh you can be pretty sure that never happens. Um, the reason is it gives one two things. One is it's robust. Because I now know that whatever happens, I can never do any worse than that, okay? Because I have assumed the worst condition. Second thing is it gives me a bound around the best that's possible, okay? 
the, those optimal ratio and the optimal regret, it gives me a bound. So here I'm comparing um, the optimal average. So I'm considering a scenario where there is a unknown parameter alpha. So this index, the, this gives the uh, channel model. Um, alpha is a constant between minus 5 and 5. I don't know alpha exactly. I can simply assume that alpha is 0 or assume alpha is 2 and derive the best average reward strategy. And that is given by the red and the, the dotted curve here. Okay? On the other hand, if I don't know these, and if, if you look at these two curves, they can be pretty bad if my guess is off. So this red curve is good when alpha is actually 0. So this is the highest among all strategies. But if my estimate is off, I can become the worst. Right? Same thing with assuming alpha to be 2. What, what happens with these robust strategies is given by, let's just take a look at the, uh, the one given by these crosses, this line, is that I know I'm in between these. Meaning that when the, the guess is correct, I can never be the best. But when a guess is off, I can be much better than if you guessed wrong. Okay? That's basically the, the robustness given by these worst case strategies. OK, so conclusion. Uh, we b I basically looked at two specific formulations. One um, we, we approached using stochastic optimization. The other we approached using competitive analysis. And some variations, uh, some of which we're actively pursuing, one is how to better model uh, probing errors, as was raised earlier. Uh, and there are more regulatory, other regulatory constraints, how to model those. And thirdly, one thing that I'm very interested in is what happens uh, when you have unknown channel statistics. So even in the worst case study that I just presented, I basically assume I don't know those transition probabilities, but I actually imply, implicitly assume that I know the model. It's a two-state Markov chain. I just don't know the probability. What if I don't even know the model? How do I compute a good uh, algorithm online? Okay. And with that, um, two references. So most of the talk is based on these two papers uh, um, that appeared last year and one that's going to come out this year. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, it's been a long talk, and I'll take any questions. So what's your, uh, what's your suggestion for practical people who use this? Um, so I think um, the... Um, I think the first framework, right, if, if you are involved in a sequential decision scenario, I think it's, it's actually quite useful. Now, one has to, um, to get a reality check on what is the time scale of these things. Exactly how long does one probe take? Um, given the system, they, it, the result may come back negative, basically saying all you can afford is just one probe. In which case, you now switch to the, to the second model, which is I predetermine which channel I probe, and that's it. Once I probe, I have to stick with that. Okay, it's either available or not available, and we have some ongoing work on that as well. Um, but I guess in general, the message is I think it's possible to, to take a practical scenario you have and be able to come up with an abstraction that, that you can analyze, and the result can turn out to be, to be useful. Now, one thing I want to add is the, the gain you actually get, right? So the, the, the actual gain you get from doing this versus not doing this, or just to do something greedy, highly depends on the actual channel statistic, this, this diversity gain. I mean, how much diversity do you have in your channel? Um, with this, in certain systems, you may have very limited, and that's something we talked about the other day, is you may have very limited diversity gain in which case, this is not a bad thing to do. All that is, you, you, you went through all this trouble probably just getting <laughs> a very small percentage of gain. And that happens to a lot of optimization problems, is that conceptually, you do a lot of work. But practically, once you plug in the numbers, the gain may be very limited. 
and that's something that needs to be checked without you know having more data it's 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 hard to uh, it's hard to judge one more question yeah i have one question so um I think about it is you know, um, this uh, all, you know, if I want to put it into the device, so what exactly the process is how you need it to, to handle this algorithm? So the, um, the, the algorithm, so the first algorithm, which is the optimal one, is quite complicated. You have to compute all, all subsets of S. The two suboptimal algorithms are fairly simple. I essentially, it's a comparison between four parameters. And each parameter is computed, you can, you can compute them uh, ahead of time. You can compute them offline. Um, actually, let me just also mention, if you assume you know the channel statistics, these algorithms are actually offline algorithms. When you execute them online, it's nothing but a table lookup. You look at the, the outcome of your probing, and then you look at look it up on the table in the, in the table the decision tree it tells you exactly what to do next the, the the what you really want to use of course is an online algorithm assuming a lot of noise in your probing and noise in your knowledge of the channel i think in in reality you cannot you cannot assume you actually know the channel when you make the device and that's just that's just not possible um is online algorithms and there are on this is one thing we're actively uh, looking into um, adaptive algorithms, um, model estimates or parameter estimates. If I don't know them, how do I how do I learn over time? Uh, I start off with a pretty bad algorithm performance, and then a, you know sort of something like policy iteration, and gradually converge to something better. Yeah, the, these are offline algorithms. So they're 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 very easy to execute. Okay, further questions maybe over lunch. Thanks very much. Thank you.